One of the most important things that I see in the protests as I've watched them in the last 10 years, but also going back 30, 40 years, uh, are two dimensions of, of women. <clears throat> One is the uh, increased public role that women play in the protests on the street, in political uh, fora, and, and other ways. And the second is the increased participation of younger women, including primary and secondary school girls who go to the protest marches with their teachers and their parents tell them go and they sometimes go on their own. Girls 12, 14, 15 years old, three or four of them at a time, I've seen them in protests in Lebanon and other places and they're going to the protest. They're not going to a party, they're not going with their uh, with their friends, they're not going with their, they're not going with their boyfriends or their, or their parents or their teachers, they're just going by themselves, groups of three, four young girls, and they hold signs, and it's it's really an important indicator of a deeper change that I see in society, which is uh, women at all uh, levels, all ages, have transcended the traditional uh, control mechanisms that society has put on them, uh, and they're breaking out of those control mechanisms and demanding their full citizenship rights and their place to bring those rights about, their place in the transformation of society. I don't know if you notice that in uh, these things. I do. I think that's actually a trend we're been, we've been seeing. Uh, the Middle East, unfortunately, has this unique reputation of being particularly bad for women. And so when we see women at these protests, we're suddenly surprised that they're out there raising claims and you know standing ground and very often pushing to the front of lines by riot police and things to sort of dare the police to you know, come after women with cameras around, et cetera. Um, but my other research has shown that in some countries, there's women have been at the forefront of protests for a long time and simply haven't been noticed, particularly in the Arab nationalist movement. There were a lot of women's protests, even women's marches that were 100% women. Uh, and of course, a lot of issues that deal pertain to women's issues directly as well. But there has been an increase, I do think, and in an increase of women organizing their own protests and not just showing up to other protests. And I think that's an important distinction. And, and a little twist to this I've noticed, which I haven't studied it, I hope scholars are doing it, is the role of women creative artists, uh, poets, uh, painters, um, the, the things that uh, they do in the, in the novelists, um, in creative arts that are linked to the protest movement. Very powerful. I agree. And I think if you think of protests not simply as people marching on the street, raising placards, but making claims in public space, then that opens up ways to think about art, think about poetry, think about the ways in which women are inhabiting spaces differently than they were before, or in their own ways and on their own terms. I think we've definitely seen an increase of that across the region in mm -hmm. really exciting ways. And, and in, in Lebanon, I've seen it personally many times. In Palestine, I've seen it. Uh, in Iraq, I've talk to people who've been involved in it. You have women working quietly behind the scenes in leadership roles, trying to create the new mechanisms of statehood, the structures of statehood, writing laws, uh, writing regulations, so that when a transition happens one day, whether it's in two years or 20 years, there'll be these blueprints for how we want our societies uh, to be organized. And, and women working both at the, at, at the level of political transitions and social and cultural transitions, but also at the practical level of, uh, of uh, helping to develop the mechanics of a protest, support groups, medical groups, uh, making signs, uh, making masks, uh, uh, food, uh, taking care of kids who are out of school to make sure they're schooled. All of these support, role, support roles in the community as well as leadership roles in the political transitions. It's very... Very exciting, and it's largely unappreciated by the global media, as far as I can tell. The current uh, decade of protests is, is a continuation of what we've seen in the last 40 or 50 years, uh, but it's taken it to a much higher level, and it's much broader across society. It's much more intense because people are more scared about their basic uh, livelihoods. But I've seen uh, people protesting in the Middle East since the 1970s. Uh, and there's clearly a difference. The main one is that it's no longer just small groups protesting one item. You know, it's not just a teacher strike for better pay or students striking uh, for human rights or somebody wanting the price of gasoline to be lowered 
That's what used to happen, and the governments could handle those one issue limited uh, protests. This is all encompassing, people are complaining about all, all aspects of, uh, of life. But uh, Jillian, you've been researching this issue for uh, many, many years, so you're the expert on this. Tell us what you see. Well, I agree that what was surprising about the uprisings is they are multi sectoral. Uh, uh, protests. So you had people from all these other protest movements coming together in this space, as well as people who had no history of being engaged in protest or social activism at all. And so that's what made them quite remarkable and made them stand out. Comparing to other protests historically, in one sense, there's not that different in the sense we have this literature on social movements and mobilization that works quite well as you apply it to new cases. But what is really different was the era of social media and technology is profoundly different. So people have been protesters using SMS services to, to coordinate since the uh, 90s and 2000s. But now with Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, the ability for people to upload uh, videos of what's happening immediately up to YouTube, the ability to spatially map where those are being uploaded from, so you can put together a picture. It's hard for governments to control messages anymore. Uh, when I met you in Jordan in the 90s, uh, we did your show, Encounter, and out at the, the television station, it was a militarized space because it used to be that governments had to control television and radio to control the message. That's not possible anymore, and I think it's for, for regimes to scramble um, to figure out how to do that. It's positive in the sense, as you talk about in your paper, the ways in which they can use it to mobilize, but there's also downsides. In the Bahrain Revolution, after it was crushed, it used crowdsourcing on social media to identify protesters so that they could go and target them. So it really does, it can go, it can go both ways. In many ways, governments and intelligence agencies don't mind if people use social media because they can trace them. They can find out what they're saying and who's saying what. Um, is this something that you think is going to continue or will the protesters get wise? I mean, they have to some extent, but will, will this vulnerability be handled, do you think, by the protesters? So I think the protesters uh, get wise, as you say it. I think they know very well. Protests are, most protests are, have Facebook pages. So they're announcing that they're going to be there. What they do less is, is connect with friends uh, on those spaces so that you can identify networks of friends. Um, and they'll move to signal or other more secure ways to coordinate off of those spaces. But they're very unafraid to post things on Facebook. People are being arrested in multiple countries for um, those postings, political postings, criticisms. Uh, in Jordan, as you may well know, um, changes to the uh, anti-terrorism law uh, extended that if you criticize the regime, it's an act of terrorism. Mm -hmm. And changes to the cybercrime law means if you do that on Facebook page, you can be arrested. So uh, Imad Hejaj, the cartoonist, the Jordanian cartoonist, was arrested last year, I believe in August, for posting a cartoon, not publishing it, posting it on social media, criticizing the Abraham Accords. Mm -hmm. And he was arrested for terrorism. Wow. Those charges were dropped. But the governments are using governments across the region are using this anti-terrorist legislation, using social media spaces as ways to sort of ferret out dissent and harass them. They're not silencing them, but I think they're more trying to make examples of certain cases to intimidate people. It's not clear who's winning. Well, I was going to ask you about that because what I see is exactly that, the government using... Uh, methods to intimidate people. They arrest somebody, they uh, t uh, call them into court, they put them in prison for a night, they maybe take bring charges. Uh, they do all, and sometimes they beat them up. They do all kinds of things to intimidate people. But what's happening, as far as I can tell, in many of these situations in the region, is that when somebody is taken away uh, by the police or the security, immediately the word is sent around and th tens and maybe hundreds of people go to the police station and stay there. Lawyers come and try to figure out what's going on and, and help them out. So do you see the intimidation, the traditional intimidation tactics of states um, being blunted by the response of the protesters or not necessarily? I think it varies from uh, context to context because in some places, if you're the sort of you know average Muhammad on the street and you get picked up, nobody knows who you are. You're maybe not connected, so you really don't have an, a, a way to lobby to get you released. But in other other cases, if you are a known activist, mm -hmm. they instantly mobilize. They'll have campaigns. People will call Amnesty International to try to get attention. And so there, there's ways in which if you're known. In some ways, you're safer than if you're an average person. 
And countries across the, the region use different tactics. They often will try to like offer them a position in government, uh, make threats towards their businesses, tell them that nobody in their extended family is ever going to get into college. So they put all kinds of pressure short of, uh, including torture, but short of torture, mm -hmm. all kinds of pressure to try to silence activists as much as they possibly can. And we've also seen <clears throat> governments, in fact, the four that I looked at, Sudan, um, Lebanon, Iraq, and Algeria, all four governments, when confronted with big street demonstrations, made initial concessions. Some of them quite significant, some of them medium. Um, but none of them were accepted. The, the, the protesters said, "This is you're just playing games with us. You've done this before. We want real change. And they kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Do you see any sign that the ability of the protesters to push back against the governments, even when governments shoot protesters, as happened in, in all these cases, protesters, sometimes in the hundreds. In Iraq, it was like six, 700 people were killed in Sudan as well. Do you see any signs that the pushback by the protesters against the governments is making any headway, or are we stuck in this stalemate forever? Well, I don't think we're stuck in the stalemate forever, but we're in a bit of a stalemate. The protesters, because they're able to be visible, they're able to show atrocities much more than they were able to previously. They can control the narrative to some extent. They have the upper hand, particularly for countries like Jordan and Morocco that want to show themselves to be moderate and progressive. So they have a little bit of uh, pressure there. But at the same time, they, they're continuing to go after protesters and silence them. They're not tolerating dissent in, in the same kinds of ways. And that is often targeting individuals as opposed to whole movements or simply shutting everything down completely. So I think you're seeing a combination. I don't think we're stagnant. And one of the things I like that you talk about in your, your paper is the ways in which there's a memory to protests. And so mm -hmm. the memory could be, wow, that was a bad idea, we're worse off now. Or the memory could also be, look, historically, we have been able to get change. Mm -hmm. Change has been realized, and maybe we lost this moment. But there are generations that that's a real live, immediate memory to them. And maybe mm -hmm. they're waiting, and I know they're waiting, and mobilizing and looking for new, new opportunities to find new openings. Yeah, one of the fascinating things is you really have two generations of protesters. You've got the people who are like under 25. Mm -hmm. They don't remember the 60s and 70s and 80s and uh, the days when the Arab world was more or less developing okay. Uh, and and um, they, they only uh, remember the last 20 years when you've had poverty, repression, wars, brutality, etc. And so you really have two very different kinds of people in the protest movements. Do you, in your study uh, that you've done on Jordan for your forthcoming book, do you see any change over time in how activists and protesters work? Well, I trace back uh, actually 150 years to look at which repertoires that were you know, under the Ottoman and under the British still linger today. And a lot of them exist, particularly in the tribal East Bank areas of blocking road and sabotaging infrastructures. That's a tried and true repertoire that exists. Yeah. But what's emerged since the 50s and 60s are sit-ins and strikes and other forms of protest. And so you do see an evolution of these sort of repertoires of protest, and you see an evolution of repertoires of repression as well. Right. Um, protesters are not only learning from each other and from protesters in other countries and globally, repressive regimes are also learning from what other repressive regimes are doing. Yeah, and, re and repressive regimes, uh, help each other, one of the things they do is they arrest a national of uh, another country in their country and send them back to their home country for the kinds of things you mentioned, that they're insulting the leadership or harming Islam or uh, creating uh, insecurity or something like that. And, and so you'll get uh, somebody, uh, a Bahraini in Jordan will be arrested and sent back to Bahrain or a Jordanian uh, some and the UAE will be arrested and uh, kept in the UAE and things like that. Uh, this is a, a, ser a serious threat. And I would add, just it's even worse than that. I mean, it is certainly that that that's certainly happening. But to the case of Bahrain and Jordan, Jordan sent gendarmerie to Bahrain to help crush Bahrain's uprising. Mm -hmm. um, rumors in Jordan were that it was actually a Jordanian gendarmerie officer who suggested dismantling the Pearl Roundabout. Wow. We don't know if that's the case, but there's a back and forth. It's not simply uh, scratching each other's back, but it's sending troops right. to each other um, to actually participate in repression of political dissent. Mm -hmm. But Arab governments have always done that, training and things of that nature, helping each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the past, of course, we had people like 
uh, Jordan and Egypt and other countries, sending their troops to places to quell rebellions. Uh, but now they're f using new forms, which they claim is just applying the law, which is arresting somebody because he or she wrote something in a social media post that was uh, dangerous to the regime and sending them back to another country. This is a new level um, of, uh, of uh, uh, oppression by governments, which we haven't really seen uh, taken to that extreme. Absolutely, and the governments can do it within the parameters of the law if the law is so broad that criticizing a friendly government is tantamount to an act of terrorism. Yeah, and, there you, and see, I remember this going back to the, again, to the 70s and different countries, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, where the governments would do something and, and, and somebody would complain and they would say, look, we're just applying the law and the law was passed by parliament and parliament is elected by the people and you can take it to court if you don't like it. But of course, the court is going to rule for the government. So this this claim that the governments make that they're, they're working according to the rule of law uh, in the past used to be very effective with foreign governments, and but now less so, I think. I agree. I think it's hard to defend what's happening as any democratic procedure. So one of the things I find interesting about the uprisings that often doesn't get covered, particularly in regular media outlets, is the deep involvement of the United States in the region. We know it's deeply involved. It's not a secret. But we tend to look at the uprisings as if they're standalone units. What happened in Egypt is about Egypt domestic politics. What happened in Bahrain is about Bahraini domestic politics. And we've talked a bit about the role of Saudi Arabia and other Gulf actors who are all trying to, and, and Turkey, trying to exploit the uprisings to extend their reach in the region. What about the United States? My impression of the United States is that it had a pretty coherent policy from roughly the 1950s till the 1990s, which was protect Israel, keep the flow of oil going, and keep out the Soviet Union. Those three things were its uh, main concerns, and that required them supporting the Arab autocratic regimes, whether they were uh, monarchies or so-called republics. but. Um, and so there's that long tradition of American support, which was relatively consistent. Um, and um, people complained about it, but nobody could do anything about it. What's happened now is we've got this new factor of uh, huge popular uprisings. The citizens of the Arab countries are speaking out. They don't like what the United States is doing, whether it's in Israel or in supporting dictators or in other things. Um, so the citizens of the Arab world are rising up, and the United States doesn't quite know how to deal with self-determinant citizens, with, with citizens who actually speak their mind, who demand their rights. And the, the language of the uprisings is exactly, exactly the language of the American Declaration of Independence. It's almost identical, what they're seeking. Uh, uh, the other thing that's happened is you've got all these other powers that are much more directly involved in the Middle East now, Turkey, uh, Russia um, is way more involved now than it was before. Uh, Iran directly involved in several countries. And the U UAE and the Saudis are doing things all around the region. So you've got a lot more internal and regional dynamism going on, which in the past it wasn't like that. You have basically had the Russians or the Soviets and the Americans uh, and the Israelis. And uh, so th I think the U.S. is totally uh, confused. Uh, still basically supports the autocratic regimes because it's afraid that if things open up, you're going to get uh, chaos and terrorism. Um, now, the U.S. also maintains this policy, I believe, because they feel that terrorism is pretty much under control, that the U.S. is not heavily threatened by terrorism. Other people may be, but the U.S. doesn't care about other people. And the oil flow is moving. That's never going to change. People are going to sell the oil. And then you've got the question of Israel. Israel is very powerful. Israel can protect itself, doesn't need the U.S. Um, and therefore, I, I sense that the United States doesn't see the Middle East as a, a region of strategic importance like it used to be. There still are important elements in the region, but nowhere does the importance of the Middle East to the U.S. today get close to what it was in the 50s and 60s and um, and, and 70s. And therefore, I think uh, U.S. policy in the Middle East is kind of floating a little bit. And we'll see what happens with the Biden people now they're in power. You're starting to see little hints of 
some changes uh, here and there with uh, the Turks and the Saudis and, and, and others. Uh, but I, I sense that the United States is, um, is a power that is less interested in the Middle East than it used to be. What do you think of that? I think it's differently interested. Certainly the Trump administration was something apart. And for me, the most troubling part about the Trump administration, although there were so many, but with regards to this question, is the emergence of these sort of strongman leaders that don't want to answer to the public, that want to build this cult of personality, this daddy state, only I can save the nation. And we're seeing that in Sisi's Egypt, we're seeing that with Erdogan, we're seeing it in the Philippines, Duterte, and elsewhere around the world. And to me, that was a really troubling trend that suggested a shift in US policy um, from you know, decades, which had, as you said, had largely remained unchanged to he just didn't care about things in the traditional relationships in certain ways. He wanted people he could do business with. He wanted people that would tell him how great he was, that didn't question him. Uh, so now we're back with Biden. So one wonders, is that lingering cult of personality-ness going to shake up uh, the U.S. Relationship, relations with the region? Certainly Mohammed bin Salman would prefer Trump oh. uh, as other these strongmen were. And so I'm wondering, it's hard for me to uh, say what the U.S. relationship is right now because we're only a few months in. I'll need to observe it. But I'm curious if well, you think that's, that's a factor. Well, I think these strong um, strongman cults clearly expanded under Trump, but I don't think it started under yeah. Trump. I think, I mean, he, like them, was a reflection mm -hmm. of the trend of society. And, and I think we can trace this back, and in my view, it goes back to the 1980s when you had the Reagan-Thatcher years, when the whole world was essentially shifted onto right. a course of free market, rampant free market capitalism. The, the strongman cult, I don't think, started with Trump. It started before, but it, it uh, was ex accelerated with Trump for sure. Uh, but the real turning point, I think, was the early 80s when uh, Thatcher Reagan were in power, and they galvanized this global free market rampant capitalist jamboree uh, where you could do anything you want as long as the free market uh, capitalist economy liked it. Uh, and they claimed that it was trickle-down economics, and they claimed that people were getting jobs and it was helping everybody. But we see now it was simply polarizing society into a small group of rich people, a smaller middle class, and a, and a huge number of poor people uh, at the bottom. And therefore, as you get more and more poor people, and the Arab world is, an, is a, a, a region of paupers now, uh, and the Arab region, about 70 to 75 percent of people are poor and vulnerable. According to surveys by the Arab Center in Doha, by the Arab Barometer, by uh, various different people, ESQA, the UN agency that studies economic and social conditions in the region, uh, has verified this. The multidimensional poverty surveys have identified this. The Arab world is a region of paupers, uh, and about 70 percent of them cannot meet their monthly basic family needs. And that has driven this great polarization, which leads to tension, which brings about the rule of the strongman to try to clamp down uh, on this process. And that's what we see with CC and others. To me, the fascinating thing <clears throat> is the US and the Western world in general have been pretty laid back and lackadaisical when Syria explodes, Iraq explodes, Libya explodes, Yemen explodes, Palestine explodes, Lebanon falls apart. <clears throat> and, you know, when it used to be Somalia uh, 40 years ago exploding, nobody cared. Uh, but when it's these big oil producers and big <clears throat> ideological countries in the region, in the heart of the Middle East, are falling apart, the U.S. still doesn't particularly care. They got scared when uh, ISIS was coming about, <clears throat> and they sent troops to uh, Iraq and Syria to stop the spread of the Islamic State. Um, but other than that, they're really pretty laid back about the uh, problems of the Middle East, and they leave it for the local uh, tyrants and local leaders to uh, take care of it, or the market. But the market clearly doesn't uh, apply anymore. <clears throat> so we're in this very strange moment where the Middle East, the Arab the Arab region in particular, but also when you look at Turkey and you look at Iran, they have problematic uh, situations in their, their economies and their politics. Uh, and Israel has, is becoming a very right-wing apartheid state, as people are now formally calling it. Uh, 
<clears throat> and the U.S. doesn't seem to mind very much. Uh, and I, the only explanation I can give for that um, is that while Somalia in the 80s and early 90s became the world's first disposable state, that you could get rid of this state, it could fall apart, nobody cares, you could dispose of it. The Arab region is starting to look like the world's first disposable entire region, that all the Arab countries together, despite their oil, despite whatever, their strategic position, which isn't that strategic anymore, except for shipping lanes, as we saw in the Suez Canal, that um, the Arab region is, is really not so important. And therefore, all you have to do is just prevent terrorism and mass migration. And whatever they do internally, if they fight, if they kill each other, uh, let them do it, as long as it doesn't reach Europe and, and the Western world. That's my interpretation. It's a little gloomy, but it's based on what I see in front of me. But we'll have to wait for history to run its course and see what happens. In the meantime, three quarters of the citizens of these Arab countries are out there on the street demanding equal rights, rule of law, uh, accountability, etc. Water, electricity. Water, yeah, basic, basic uh, foods. Biological needs and political rights. Um, and that's why I think they will triumph eventually. But we don't know if that's going to be in two years or six years or 20 years. But eventually they have to uh, triumph uh, because there's no force in the world as, as powerful as the force of an entire citizenry that wants to be free and to live in dignity. Uh, the, the citizens are trying to figure out how to do that. And we're, this is an a on-the-job learning process for the protest movements. And they're still learning and they're still on the job. And when the COVID situation clears up in a year or so, we're going to see all kinds of new, uh, new dimensions to this.